Hello, I am Super Orange Cat today, and here I am presenting my quick review on episode 6 of season 2 of Main Abyss, the English dub aired last night on Tanami, and I'm going to give my thoughts on it. So I'll go with the things I did like, and then some things I didn't like, and then tie up a big ol' Super Orange Cat bow at the end. Now let's go into some of the things I definitely liked about this episode. I liked how they kind of did a little fake out in the beginning. Like, you have Rico deciding, what am I going to sacrifice to bring back Nanachi? And then you had Maju Kaja show up and be like, no, no, Rico, don't, don't do this. Don't, don't, Rico. You're going to do something stupid, Rico. Don't do this. Pulling them away. Literally, they having to restrain her away. I think Ma had to come in there and help restrain her, too. And then at the end, when she comes out, she told Vuko, this sucks. Nanachi's dead. And Vuko's like, oh, no. And then they hear rattling, and then you get the whole main plot, which involves the big old jellyfish thing. The big old jellyfish thing, I like too, because they added a little bit more lore to the village of, well, since hollows can't leave the village, they need food, they need stuff to increase the value of the village, which is ultimately beneficial for everyone, because it makes it easier to acquire more things. So it's like, oh, we can bring in something to, and we'll just kill it. And this was a jellyfish that came in before, and they failed to kill and has acquired a taste for hollows. Which made the situation more dire, which ultimately leads to probably the best Rico moment, I would argue, for the entire series to this point, where she basically single-handedly concocts the plan to stop and kill this jellyfish thing, which really everything was mentally her idea, like the whole plan, the whole mirror, fake it out, trap it, and just keep jamming stuff into it to kill it. I really liked, again, and also... And there's a weird trend, and there's probably a bunch of anime and American TV shows that do this. There are, I can actually recall quite a few, but it's weird. This is the second anime in around a year or so, where you have a main female protagonist who's defining, one of her defining characteristics is her youth and beauty, and she cuts off her hair. And she's blonde too, like, so yeah, I'm comparing Rico here to Fena. And again, that's something too, Fena I thought was... Well, I, Fena and Rico have a very similar, well, in my head, a very similar, like, trajectory of how I like them or not. At the beginning of both of Fena, I didn't like her as much, but as time got on, I really, really started to like her character. Same thing with Rico. First few episodes, I really wasn't a fan of Rico, but, like, more moments, more time that she got to develop her character, and you see what she's capable of, and you see what she's learned, and see all the lessons she's applied so far, she becomes a much, much better character. And right now, she's definitely in my top three favorite characters of the entire show. And this episode was the pinnacle moment so far for her, where she concocts this brilliant plan, where although she might be small in stature and not physically nearly as strong or capable as someone like Reg, she can plan things out and to help people. And this almost backfires until we get the other really, really great moment of the episode, where we get... Rico gets the whistle back, which is basically the remnants of Prushka, blows it, and realizes that basically it now functions as a summon rag whistle, where, because the point of the whistle is if you hear it, you suddenly remember what your true purpose is, and we know now, rag's true purpose is to protect Rico at all costs. So he comes in and actually doesn't save Rico, he actually saves Ma, because Ma threw herself in front of Rico and she was about to be attacked by the jellyfish monster. And we get a bit, and that's a little bit more to Reg's lore, where it feels like, I said, it was already a popular fan theory that Reg's, the reason, the point of Reg was that he was commissioned or created or something with Liza to protect Rico, or perhaps, perhaps physically to bring her down into the abyss to be with her mother. And this episode really helps that theory a lot, with Reg's true purpose being revealed to protect Rico. And that's what supposed to matter the most to him because he was until this point he was just kind of aimlessly wandering around outside the village he got picked up by the other interfering unit where he basically got discussion about with the other interfering unit about what the whole point of his kind is and that was last episode and that's the first time we saw him this episode and that's something i really came to like he's got this little reveal about reg's character and also about, he goes kind of, this is like the third different time we found out, oh, he can go sicko mode. First time was the existence of the incinerator, where he can basically one-punch man something out of existence. 
You also got, if you watch Dawn of the Deep Soul, you'll know that if he takes up electricity, he turns into a weird, super-powered, thoughtless, electric goblin demon thing. And in this episode, if you blow the white whistle, all of his equipment, his helmet, his robe turns white, and his skin gets a little more melanated, you know? So, and that's like, and also he gets hyper-focused, and he just comes in and finishes off the jellyfish monster. And I guess with those couple really good things like about this episode, I'll go into some of the stuff I didn't really like. This episode, okay, this is something really actually the previous episode. By the way, they did a terrible job of disguising Vuko. You can see in this picture, if you're one of the old Ganja Suicide Corps, it's been a minute and a half into this video, I can say that word. And, like, you're with Vuko. She has a very distinctive hair coloring pattern. You see this girl on the left here. Would you be confused? Would you think it's someone other than her? Especially since apparently she wronged you. So that face is seared into your memory forever, for good or for worse, for better or for worse. And here we kind of get the reveal that way that Maju Kaju was not one of the members of that group. Neither was the old chef woman who owned the restaurant. That's a little bit interesting, Lord. They gave her a little bit of a role in this episode because, again, she should be the most knowledgeable about who Vuko is. Not really who Vuko is, but how she's now here. Because she was the one that told Rico, there's caves over here, go down there, and then that's where Vuko was. And this, and it's like a little bit thing too. And also, here's another thing, and this will probably be addressed in future episodes, so maybe they have an answer for this. This is not really a complaint yet, because it doesn't, there's no issue with it at the moment. They say explicit in this episode, Hollows can't leave the village. You see in the episode when Reg first encounters Faputa, the Hollows couldn't leave the village. And since Reg was able to go through, back out, that means that he is not a Hollow, which I think first season Nanashi thought Reg was a Hollow. But again, we do get the reveal of the previous episode. He's an interfering unit, so he's more of a robot. He's not a Hollow. So regardless of this MIDI situation, even if Nanachi gets saved, which let's be honest, he probably will be, in theory, he can't leave because he's a hollow already. So he can't go out. And no one's addressed this. Like, no one thought of, hey, if we bring back Nanachi, he'll still have to live in this village forever. I don't know. Maybe future episodes deal with this in a better way. And another thing I thought was interesting, more interesting than like or dislike, was what Vuko does towards the end of the episode. Because you get people pretty damn suspicious of hey, who's this human girl that just showed up all of a sudden that Rico brought in? Majukaju sniffs her and is like, I don't recognize your scent, mostly because he's like hundreds of years of stank. Because look, she's been in that cave. Like, she's been in that cave presumably before Orth existed. And by the time in the first season, it looks like Orth has been there for a while. So from before then, she's been chained up. Presumably it was like days or weeks and once she suffered her, until she started suffering her fate. And then you have all this thing, time go down. Riku talks to his terms revolving around cave raiders. Vuko has no idea what the hell she's talking about. She's like, what's a white whistle? Stuff like that. And, and Vuko says, time works differently here. I have no idea. I have no idea how much has passed where you're from. And then she does say, I'm part of this group. We were down here. And there's only a few of us left. Which implies probably only people living... That were from that group were the sages. So all the other hollows like Ma and all the other ones who didn't like immediately recognize Vuko probably had no idea who she was because she were they were hollows that were unrelated to this group that just over time wandered into the village and like, oh wait, we can't leave now because of this barrier. So that leaves the snake guy who it's already been spoiled multiple times by people on Tanami that the spiky snake guy is the white-haired boy that Vuko talks with in the first episode of this season. And also, they have a pretty strong reveal. She might have outright said his name for at the end of this episode where the red sage guy that talks to that talked to Rico when she was at like the restaurant with Ma a couple episodes ago, that they said, oh, this is one of the sages, is the guy with like the, the leader of that group, the guy with like the scar on his face and the black hair, the rugged-looking guy. Because then Vuko... When she sees him, she's behind a pillar hiding, because she would know that he would recognize her. That implies that the sages, 
or people of high value here are the people that were part of this initial group because in many ways they were the founders of this village because Vuko cursed everyone. So you have Spiky Hair Boy, you have Leader Guy, and then Vuko Strip says she's a sage, which one can argue is her trying to mislead people because like, oh, if, if they know who I am, they'll all hate me or kill me or I'll be chained up in Goo Land again. And but it makes sense, too, that she's a sage, because one, she seemingly knows what's happening in the village even when she was in the caves. Like, she was able to immediately tell Rico, hey, I think I know where one of your friends is, and she leads him to the cave with the spiky hair boy. And also, the fact that she really seems in tune, like, it's almost like she's watching a crystal ball and is able to react to the events that happen to the main characters here, up until when she gets taken out of the cave. So it makes sense that, oh, if you survive this, you're you're the sages. So Spike Hair Boy, Leader Guy, and Vuko are still alive, so they're the sages, while Faputa, who also is part of that group because she's a native girl, is the princess and her own existence is a super high value, which leads to making her the MacGuffin of the season. So basically the point is, if you can bring back anything from Faputa, get back here then you could probably get Nanachi and trade it to Spiky Hair Boy, and he'll probably accept that trade. So that's where we set up, and right now that doesn't seem like a high bar, because, I mean, Reg went out to get it, and Reg is Faputa Magnet, because Faputa's in love with him. So at this point, I guess might as well just fashion him like a boy pussy or something, and let her go to town, and then bring what's left over over to uh, the Spiky Hair Boy, and be like, here, here's, here's Faputa's essence as it were, you know, or something. It's obviously a joke. Oh, this series, I mean, this episode, another moment I have to mention, I thought it was funny as hell at the time. First, there's a lot of captioning this episode because there are multiple times where the, the people in the market were saying stuff, and it's plot important enough that the, the watcher has to know what they're saying in their native language, which I think it's one of the situations you see sometimes in anime, where if they're speaking a foreign language, then in the sub, or the Japanese version, that language happens to be English, or a very close offshoot of English. I remember they did this with Another World my, another world with my smartphone, where all the inscriptions on the wall in this foreign language were all just, like, really cursived out English. I think here in the dub, they replaced it all with Japanese. But some of the words that Rico says to direct the, mark, the, the people to stop and kill this jellyfish monster sounded phonetically very Japanese, or definitely very East Asian. So I think they're doing that switcheroo thing. I don't know, because I haven't watched the sub. So it might be like, it's like, they speak Japanese, like, stop, it's right there! Be like, or something like that, you know? I think, that's my best guess, I haven't watched the sub. But I'm pretty sure they're speaking Japanese in the English version when they're doing the uh, language of Ilbu. And another thing is that when Rico gets Prushka the whistle back, and it's hammered out perfectly into this white whistle shape that she saw Bondrude, Ozen, and her mother have, then the guy who, like, the, the, the miller who hammered it out said, like, I had an amazing time doing this. I climaxed. And then turns into a giant monster and starts fighting the jellyfish. <laughs> it's the type of thing you can only think of in a messed up fever dream. And I absolutely loved it. But again, this episode, I thought because first, the first season, full of action. Second season, outside of, like, maybe one brief moment where Reg fought the dragon last episode, and then the second episode when they're running away from the poison gas, this was a very low-impact season in terms of action. And really, it feels like the rest of the season's gonna be more intrigue of finding out what happened to Vuko's group, why did things end up the way they are, and Vuko inevitably having to interact again with Faputa, who she betrayed, the head sage guy who she betrayed, and arguably Spiky Hair Boy who she betrayed. And that's going to be interesting, because there's a lot to develop with Vuko's character. And like I said but last video, how this show has treated its character so far, how this show has handled its plot so far, I do have full faith that they stick to landing with Vuko and her plot. What do you guys think? If I'd rate this episode, not as good as last week. I'd say 7.5 out of 10. What do you guys think? Leave your comments, leave your opinions down below. I am the Super Orange Cat, and that is all.